Church. I hope you're all excited to be here. Uh, it's nice to come in out of that weather, a little rainy and cold today. So uh, it's the Northwest at its finest before we get to the sunshine. So as you may have noticed, uh, Bob and Sharon are taking a much needed uh, break. They're down in Oregon enjoying some time of relaxation. If they're watching, uh, we miss you. We'll be looking forward to seeing you back when you come. And uh, we just have a couple of announcements today. Lots of stuff going on. It's a pretty exciting time. It's heading towards summer. We're all busy, and the church is doing some great things, too. But just on just some business that we need to get going, um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I try and find somebody's name in the directory, and I can't find it. And so we're trying to update the phone directory, which I think is really great. So we're asking everyone, either fill out a connection card, email uh, Sharon, and get those in by May 29th so we can get a new directory with all of the people in there again so that when we're trying to reach somebody, we can just open it up and we can get that. So that's really important. And then also by uh, May 29th, um, sorry, I said April 29th, May 29th, because we're already past that. On May 29th, too, we want to get in all the registration forms for the women's fall retreat. And so if you can get those in, if you have any questions, it's a two-day retreat over at Black Lake Camp. Should be a lot of fun for the ladies. And not to be outdone by the ladies, I'm going to have Rob come up and talk about the men. You don't need to do cover shots. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm sure you could take a picture. Yeah, I can imagine. All right, now we're talking about what's going on with the men. I actually have a, a lot to go over this morning. In the bulletin, it talks about next week's breakfast. So that is at the Hampton Inn here in Lacey, the men's breakfast. It's at 8 a.m. So please, men at the church, please join us. We'll be reaching out to you. It's going to... Um, Scott will be providing the message, and so we're looking forward to you being there. We are at, uh, taking a collection of $10 per person to help cover the cost. It, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's not mandatory, so please come no matter, no matter what. Uh, and uh, we're just going to have, an, you know, an offering box, and people can drop money. And you want to cover a couple of people, that's wonderful too. But please don't let that be a reason not to attend. Uh, also, uh, we are coming up in the month of June... The men's ministry, we're doing a baseball outing. So that's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be the Rainiers uh, uh, playing the Sacramento River Cats. And that's going to be on June 18th. That's Father's Day weekend. And so, uh, and it's a special, um, it's a special off, uh, week, eight weekend that for $19.52, that's including all the fees, that you get admission and you get a Chick-fil-A uh, sandwich and you get a baseball hat for all for $19.52. So that's an amazing deal. So men, we have up listed up on the uh, website here, the Real Hope website, right on the front page. You can click on a button to register. So um, you can, you know, bring a guest. You can, you know, bring your grandson, your ch- your kids, whatever. You can bring your wife, your children. In fact, I think it would be wonderful if you can get your children or somebody to pay for you. So you're welcome to, you know, it's Father's Day, right? Let's celebrate the men. May I help sponsor the uh, uh, dad to go to the Father's Day outing? That's at 5 p.m. on June the 18th. So we're going to allow, we're going to do registration up on the website through next Sunday service. So please, if you're interested, go ahead and fill that out. But if you do register, we are purchasing those tickets. So please, if you register, you're committed for your $19.52 per ticket. And I will come after I come for you at some point. Yep. Saturday. If I said Friday, I'm sorry. So it's Saturday, June the 18th, 5 p.m. Cheney Stadium in Tacoma. That's right. Parking is not included. So you can park off site somewhere and, and hoof it in. You can take, you know, carpool. You can do all sorts of wonderful things, but parking is not included in your mission. It's, I think it's $10 per ticket, or per car, rather, um, for people that want to park there on site. So thank you very much, and men, we're looking forward to having fun the next few months, and we'll be talking about July and August soon enough, too. So thank you. All right, we're going to ask Mark uh, to come up, too. He has an announcement he would like to make. Thanks, Terry. I just wanted to uh, mention um, we're starting a a poll, if you want to call it, or a sign-up sheet out out in the lobby that uh, if you like meeting people, if you uh, um, enjoy meeting and talking with people, we're looking for volunteers to uh, join our great ministry of greeters and ushers to uh, be a part of that. And... uh, I've got a sign-up sheet, and you probably noticed, maybe you've talked with people as you came in the door uh, on church on Sunday and uh, chatted with uh, the, the group that had been there. It's been Jeremy and his kids and uh, Jackie and I and Steve and Ruth are all part of it. Um, so uh, if, if, you've, if you enjoy that, please sign up. The more we get on this thing, the more people we can... Uh, share in that commitment to um, be a greeter and an usher. So uh, this, uh, this sign-up sheet will be out, out on the, the lobby for the next couple weeks, and so that's all I had to say. Thank you, Mark. Yep. All right, if we could have the ushers come forward, and we'll ask for a blessing and a prayer for the offering. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for all the great things that you give us. And one of those is just how you uh, take care of us financially, how you continue to show your goodness. And it's our privilege this morning to be able to return that, to give a portion of what you've so abundantly given us for the kingdom. 
We pray that you will take these monies, that you will multiply them out locally here in this church, across our community, the city of Lacey, Thurston County, and then, Lord, across our state, and finally, throughout the ends of the earth, which you have told us that you will spread your message of hope and love. And so we look forward to how you use it, Lord, and we pray that it will be to your glory and to your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 14, 31 says, So when times get tough, we can face them with confidence because God has a hold of us and is never going to let us go.
Father God, thank you, Lord, that we are all here today. Thank you, Lord, that you have brought us together in, in sunshine, in rain, in good times and bad, no matter where we are, Lord, that you have brought us because you want to remind us of who you are every day in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us today and bless our message. I pray that you would help us to reach out to the people around us who need to hear this same thing, that you are worthy of everything. Lord, that we, every song, everything that we could bring to you, that you are worthy of it because you are the only name. In your name, amen. He had he was a he had a real eye roller for jokes, and then one day I realized I was my dad, and I'm glad to be my dad. You know he's a good man, and I'm glad to be a dad, and I'm glad to be up here in front of you this morning. And I had a lot of fun researching for the last few weeks. You know, reading and listening and praying and meditating. Um, and the best part of leading a teaching like this on a Sunday morning. At least for me, it's the prep. You know, I spend, you know, f more than 40 hours preparing for a message like this. And I get to spend a lot of time with my Lord. Um, now, if you could grab your trusty Bibles. Uh, notice I said trusty Bibles and not rusty Bibles. I hope none of us have rusty Bibles. Some of you have electronic Bibles like I do. And you don't want those things to get rusty. Because they won't work very long. So if you have your Bibles... You know, okay, um, if you have your paper or electronic swords at ready, please turn with me to Acts 11, verse 27. Acts 11, 27. And the first person that gets there, 
please let everyone know what page that is. Just kidding, please don't blurt it out. They're all different, I bet. All right. So in Acts 11:27, we'll go ahead and read that. Now, at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world and this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Okay, hold this thought. Remember this scripture we just read. Prophet Agabus comes to Antioch, tells of great worldwide famine, Christians in Antioch take collection and send back to Judea. You got that? Okay. So, like, now studying all scripture, we need some context. Pastor Bob only gave me three verses, so we got to put this in context. So let's go back and set that up. At the beginning of the previous chapter, Peter was preaching the gospel there at Caesarea, to a Roman centurion named Cornelius. I'm sure you guys remember, we just went over it not too long ago. And that initiated um, inaugurating the gospel being preached to the Gentiles. The gospel being shared with the Gentiles. The door was open for the Gentiles to be part of the kingdom of God. What amazing thing you see, previously it was believed salvation was just for the Jews and to the Jews And now the door was open for everybody, for me and for all of you, non-Jews or Gentiles too. This was about there in Jerusalem by the, this was heard about there in Jerusalem by the apostles, and they were taken a bit back, right? So verse 1 of chapter 11, and the apostles and brothers that were there in Judea heard that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, had also received the word of God. So they questioned Peter, what did you do? Is that true? So in verse 4, Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order and unto them, saying, stop, right there for a moment. Notice we get to read it twice, once in chapter 10. Oh, my gosh, something bad happened. I just realized I moved two pages of notes. I'm like, what does this not make sense, Robert? No, I didn't. I'm doing right where. Ignore me, please. All right, where was I? So we get to read it twice, once in chapter 10 and then once in chapter 11. I suggested to you it's because the Lord repeats something when he repeats something in scriptures verbatim. You know, something that we previously read or studied through and it's there again. It's because the Holy Spirit is inspiring the author to repeat it once more. I know you just read it in the previous chapter, but get this down. He didn't have to write the... Rec- yeah, I did skip something. Too. That's why I'm like, this doesn't make sense. This is... We'll just edit this out for the video. See, I thought I was being smart by putting this on electronically. Yeah, exactly. Maybe that's what the whole point of this is. Okay. So the, the big point of here is, is the point I was trying to make is that in verse t- uh, in chapter 10, he tells the dream, right? And the, the dream of the uh, sheet and the being lowered down from heaven with all the beasts and everything that were in the earth um, that was unclean. And then he recounts it again in verse in chapter 11. And so that's the point that I'm trying to make, is that it is repeated twice. He didn't have to write, um, and so Luke, who is writing here in Acts, he didn't have to write the recounting of the dream over again, right? But he did. It's intentional. He wants this underscored and remembered. You know, and the point is that remember that God is all-inclusive. It is really critical that, that this be 
the this message be delivered, that the gospel is open to all. The gospel is open to everyone, not to just the Jews, but to the entire world, to the Gentiles. He welcomes anybody and everybody, Jew and Gentile. Nobody is excluded. Nobody is left out of the church. No one is left out of the body of Christ, the gospel. The kingdom of God is the most inclusive entity that's on the face of the earth today or historically. God says, whoever will let him come, all you got to do is come to him and you're in. Believe on him and you're in. So in this day, we're being told that Christianity, that we are exclusive and bigoted and homophobic. It's not true. The gospel is the most wide open, embrace it, inclusive group in the world, in the history of the world. The kingdom of God, anyone who will still ever will let him come, anyone, everyone just come believe, receive, and you're in. You see, that's it, which is amazing to me. So the message is repeated here because Peter is underlining it. The Holy Spirit inspiring Luke to record it saying, don't miss this. Peter rehearsed the matter, saying, verse 5, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend, as it were, as it had been a great sheet. It was let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me, the sheet which I had fastened mine eyes. I'm sure it looked just like that. And we remember the story of the sheet. Wild beasts and the like, right? Unclean creatures, some quite tasty. Peter's, Peter's slay and eat. <coughs> Excuse me. Peter was aghast. He said, not so, Lord, for nothing uncommon or nothing common or unclean has at any time come into my mouth. No unkosher food, but the voice um, answered and again from heaven saying, what God had, God had clean, cleansed, that call now not uncommon or unclean. And you, and you know, that's critical. You need that. We need that. Not so you can have a ham dinner on Sunday as tasty as ham is, but because your salvation, the salvation of the Gentiles must be recorded. It must have been seen and it must have been understood. It needed to be valued. It needed to have the value to all the other believers to the whole world. And it immediately went from a dream into action, into demonstration. Peter said, behold, immediately after that, there were three men already coming to that, my house where I was sent from Caesarea to me. The Spirit bade me to go with those three. No doubting. Also, six brothers, Christians, they did accompany me. So he travels from Joppa to Caesarea, meets Cornelius, the centurion. He tells of the angel in his house, which asked him to call Joppa for Simon, whose name is Peter, who shall, who shall tell the world, tell the words, thereby, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Your whole house shall be saved, he tells him. Your belief, your salvation impacts others. No more so than in your own homes. It's comforting to think you know, our Christian legacies. Generational impact of Christ. It's glorious. There's a lot to unpack and digest about that verse. And you could teach a whole sermon on that one. But we'll move on. So now the secret is out. The Lord is for everyone. The Gentiles. Jesus Christ did not die to restore the Jews to the Father, but all of humanity to the Father. They watched as the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles, the, previous, the ones that were previously excluded, the ones previously not invited. God did this. Who are they to stand against that? 
What could they do? <coughs> the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak in tongues. And they were born again and wanted to be baptized in water too. And they glorified God in amazement, saying, God also granted repentance of life to the Gentiles. And that was mind-blowing. That was jolting and jarring. That turned Jewish thought and belief onto its head. That God, you see, these Jews, <coughs> these Christian Jews would say that he granted the Gentiles, you know, that's me and you, the opportunity to repent, to change direction, and walk in newness of life. They were just blown away and said, okay, we got it. That's what God is doing. And I'll say this, may the Lord keep me and you, or perhaps make me and you, make you flexible. Make us flexible, that to be open to whatever it is the Lord wants us to do in our lives and in this church. Without saying, well, we've never done that before, or that's never, that's not, that's not what happened before. That's not who we have been. May the Lord keep you and me flexible, pliable. He's got to grow us, you know, and morph us. He doesn't want us to do what we've done. We have to prepare for what he has next for us to do. We got to think outside our box. Step outside of our comfort zone. If we're comfortable, we're probably not living on the edge for him. That's living on the edge right there. If we're comfortable, what are we doing? How comfortable am I? How comfortable are you? Can we even see the edge anymore from where we're at? It's real important for real hope for a church that's pushing 40 years old and for me as a man who's getting older too and most of you out there, except my wife, she has an age a day. But it's real important that this church and all these people um, that the Lord make us flexible and pliable, hungry and open, open to whatever he wants us to do in this day, at this time, and in this culture that, we were, that he's placed us in. And let's, let's just put this back into context. Remember the Gentiles. They were so excited to be included, to be close to God, to be accepted, to feel a direct connection to Christ, who recently in their lives walked the earth and took the punishment for their sins. They were ready to get to the edge for the Lord. We need to feel a piece of that. Next, persecution arose, and there was a scattering. But that was a good thing. Disciples that were concentrated were now being spread out. Doing what? Discipling, spreading out the gospel message. Phoenicia, Cyrene, Cyprus, and Antioch. Stephen was martyred, and the story centers on Antioch. We're getting closer to today's verses now. Antioch was the third most important city uh, in the Roman Empire. Rome, of course, is first, and there's Alexandria and Egypt. But Antioch, uh, which is near the Mediterranean coast in ancient Syria, um, which today, just inside the border of Turkey, Antioch was the third most important city. It was a city of erudite philosophy, education, and incredible commerce. It was done there, and, you know, it was, and it, but it was also a city that was notorious for its sinfulness, its sensuality. A, it was a very important Roman city. It was exceedingly wicked, dedicated to the goddess Daphne, Daphne was seduced by Apollo in their mythology. And so, the worship of Daphne was all about seduction. And consequently, all these temples to Daphne in the city in Antioch were very carnal. The first Christians in Antioch, they kept to themselves, only preaching to the Jews in the area. 
And as more Christians arrived, as Christians were being scattered from other places that, as they were being persecuted, all the people of the community, remember how I described this community a moment ago? Quite a place that they were showing up in. But they knew, these arrivers, they knew the Gospels were now open, open to all. They were beginning to say what was talked about concerning Peter uh, in the house of Cornelius. Uh, we're going to take the next step, and we're going to make that message that we present to any Gentiles anywhere. So the barriers started to come down. The parameters opening up now in the preaching of the word generally. And they spoke to the Gentiles according to verse 20. In verse 22, the good news in Antioch where masses of Gentiles were being saved reaches back to the church in Jerusalem. So now Gentiles outside of Israel out in their far-flung native lands, are hearing the gospel. They're at Antioch and in other places, and they're being born again, brought into the kingdom. So when the church leaders in Jerusalem, you know, that's Peter and James and John and the boys, when they heard these things, they sent out, and girls, uh, they sent out Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. You're familiar with good old Barnabas, or as I like to call him, Barney. His name means son of consolation or encouragement. He was an encourager. He exhorted them. He, which means to say, he, keep, keep going, kids. Keep running the race. You got this. Barney wasn't primarily a teacher nor primarily an evangelist. He, he was an encourager. This great big guy, Barnabas, large of size and giant of heart, son of consolation. That's what they called him. And that's because that's what he did. He consoled people. He loved people, and he encouraged people. The preeminent Christian life coach. So they sent Barnabas to these new believers that were saved in Antioch. Although they weren't Jews, they were Gentiles. This is just the right guy, though, to send these new Christians who were Gentiles, right? They weren't Jews. And some, you know, if they sent someone that was rigid and full of religiosity, uh, that, that wouldn't work. It was perfect to send Barnabas at that time. You know, Barney, a great purple dinosaur of encouragement, he was just happy with them, and he exhorted them. That's what he does. He's kind of like our Barney. I, I think I'd rather have their Barney. That's what he does. He exhorted them that with purpose of heart, not detailed uh, teaching of the law, no, but he did it with purpose of heart. He didn't burden them with tradition and adornments and rites. He gave them purpose of heart. He was relational. He showed faith. So just hang on to the Lord. That's what he said. Just walk with the Lord. Cleave to the Lord. Enjoy your friendship with the Lord. And what a great message that is. This exhorter Barnabas has every time that we read of him in the book of, of Acts, he's a good man. Barnabas was, verse 24 says, and you might say, well, there is none good, no, not one. Well, if the Bible says he was a good man, then he is a good man. In Christ, because of Christ and through Christ, he was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit, verse 24 says, and he was also full of faith. So Barnabas, he now leaves Antioch, where all this is coming down, where folks are being saved, where he's encouraging these new Gentile believers he leaves them for a season. He departs, and it says, and he goes to Tarsus to seek after Saul. Now, Saul is known to us, who, um, of course, is Paul. Barnabas um, knew this, this incredible, um, what were they going to say? You know, so this is really an important thing. Barnabas knew he needed somebody critical that could take him to the next step. A revival is breaking out. Things are taking place. 
they need to be taught, these new Christians here in Antioch. Barnabas encouraged them. You know, he got the crown warped up, so to speak. But now they need to be taught the ways of the Lord more fully. Antioch was an intellectual center steeped in Greek culture. In fact, it was the capital city of the prior Seleucid dynasty, which broke off from Alexander the Great's empire. It was steeped in Greek understanding and philosophy, and it was sophisticated and urbane. And here's Barnabas. Just the guy that uh, has an understanding of both of the scriptures, the Torah, and more importantly, the new covenant the, and essential Christianity. Also, since he grew up in Tarsus, which is a Greek city, he understands Greek culture. Tarsus was a key Greek city where Paul grew up and where he is at at this point. He had already been converted to Christ, as you know, spent time in the desert, as you're aware. He went back to Tarsus. He's been just doing whatever there, and Barnabas says, hey, I'm going to go see my, my buddy Paul slash Saul. I'm going to find the guy. Remember, it was Barnabas that, that brought Saul into the church after Saul was saved at Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, because they would be suspicious of the conversion of Saul, they would wonder, isn't, isn't um, you know, Barnabas says, hey, let me take you under my wing. Saul, I'll t- put, let, me, let me introduce you to the guys. I'll hook you up. I'll make it known that your thing is real. How we really need a guy like Barnabas, right? Just people that love and stand up for others and believe in others and give encouragement to others. We need that. We need that right now. But Barnabas knew, however, what he's doing is not enough, that there, that there needs to be an Antioch unteaching you know, we talk about um, a Christian worldview and a non-Christian worldview. Well, they have a worldview, even though they're saved, that is very, very different. You know, they needed an Antioch unteaching, an anti antioch teaching. Anyway, to be retaught in a deep, rich way, a new worldview... So Barnabas tracks down Paul and brings him from Tarsus. Paul had been a Christian for about 11 years at this point. Now he spends another full year, um, now he's being brought out of obscurity where he's been kind of hidden, you know, 11, 10, 11 years or so now, and Barnabas brings him to begin his teaching ministry there in critical, crucial city of Antioch where revival is happening. And they stayed there for about a year, and the disciples were first called Christians. They were called Christians first here in Antioch. And that's the name that stuck to the group, and even still today, to this group here at Real Hope. And frankly, it's the only label that I want to carry. I don't want to be known as part of this movement or a denomination. Uh, I'm happy for this, for this movement, and that denomination over there, and those guys are all wonderful, right? I don't even, but I don't even really want to be known as like a real Hopian, right? I, I go to church here. Um, it's great. You guys are wonderful. It's a good fellowship. Or, or a real hoper, or whatever, we, whatever denim we would be. I don't know. Anyway, um, but I just want to identify and be known as a Christian, just a Christian, not a Protestant, not a charismatic or a dispensationalist or an evangelical. I'm not down on those things. You know, I, I just don't find any personal, anything personally for those things. I want to be known as a Christian. But what is a Christian? It means literally a little Christ. Interesting, because it starts at Antioch where They were known, and this is true, they were known in cultural history as being named Christians in a derogatory way. The Antiochians intended to label them, it was a put-down. Well, that's the idea here, the the Christians. It was was derogatory. It means little Christ. Little Christ, you know. 
and it was used in a derogatory way. But the Christian says, hey, we'll, we'll take that. Call, you, yeah, they ran with it. Took ownership of it. Sure, we'll be called the little Christ. Kind of like the revival during the 60s and the 70s. I think most of you remember Jesus Freaks. It was intended originally, though, to mock the hippies that turned to Jesus. Well, the Jesus Freaks took that name and said, yeah, you betcha. I'm just freaked out by the Lord and with the Lord and in the Lord and for the Lord in a good way. You know, he's my passion. You see, they own the name. And compare that, though, the kinds of today's society to our woke society, always looking to be offended. Christians, we cannot be offended. If we are being labeled with Jesus Christ, if we're being identified with Jesus Christ, yeah, that's good. So the Christians own the name that was meant to be derogatory initially. But there's, but there's another interesting aspect to it too. And that is in the Roman army, in the military, soldiers took a sign of ultimate respect, took the name of their general, generals and added the suffix I-A-N to it. Like if they follow General Marcus, the most loyal, the most faithful would take on the name Marcusian. They would add the I-A-N. The Marcusian lo loyal, the Marcusian faithful, Marcus, I-A-N. The soldiers were saying, we identify with our general. We're linked to him. We're following after him. We want to be like him. We're not him. We're little Marcuses, but he's our general. So the Christians were being mocked by the title Christian, little Christ, but they also could directly see what they mean as scorn against them, it can also mean something good. Just like the Roman soldiers with little Marcus, little Julius, or whatever the name might be. So I like that, Christians. It's good to be called Christians because Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He's our Lord and leader. He, we're marching behind him, we're committed to him, and we want to be like him. As it says in the passage, they were called Christians here first in the city of Antioch. First time. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem. So the teachers, Paul, primarily are doing their teaching. The prophets are coming up from Jerusalem. The prophets are coming. The prophets are coming. I ask, who could have foretold that? Oh, that's a groaner. Come on, come on. So the prophets arrived from Jer Jerusalem, there to meet their new Antiochian brethren. They're coming to Antioch, Christian prophets. And let's see what happens in these days when the prophets arise from, arrive from Jerusalem. All right, so now we're caught up. That was the context to get us back to these verses. So I will read them to you again. Acts chapter 11, verse 27 now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. All, yep, all over the world. And this took place in reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So the prophets arrived in Antioch, a city with a multiple, multitude of new believers, Gentile believers. Uh, these believers have no legacy of God and Scripture. They are fresh. And here are some prophets. And one of them stood up, Agabus. Go ahead and remember that name because he'll pop up again later on in chapter 21. There stood up one of them named Agabus, and he is signified by the Spirit. He is prophesying in the Spirit that there should be a great dearth. There should be a drought. There should be a famine throughout all the world, the whole Roman Empire. There's going to come a famine, a dearth, a drought. 
Dearth is a great absence, a severe lacking, a scarcity. You know, like how there's a dearth of baby formula right now? Scary. It's going to get real hot. Crops are going to dry up. Smoke is going to appear. Climate change. We've heard, of, we've heard about climate change before. I guess it's not new. I don't, whatever there's going to be, you know, it doesn't matter, but there's going to be a drought. And so, consequently, there's going to be a dearth throughout the, all the empire. And by the way, this did happen, as foretold. It came to pass shortly thereafter in the days of Caesar Claudius. But watch this in verse 29. The disciples, in the proportion that they had means, every man, or as it says in the New King James, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers which dwelt there in Judea, in Jerusalem, which they did, and they sent this relief. These, this funds, this money, that the Gentile believers in Antioch raised to send the money to Jerusalem. New believers, Gentile believers, they sent this to the Jewish believers. They heard of the need, and they were moved by the Spirit, and it was sacrificial, their giving. How do we know that? Agabus told them that the famine was going to be worldwide, includes Antioch. Antioch was going to be affected. Yes, Antioch was generally wealthy, but rich people can be the hardest to get to part with their money. And then tell a rich person that they're about to be hit with a, hard with a famine, and then see how generous they're going to be. An undeterminable famine. How long? How bad? Don't know. But they felt the need. They heard with their ears. They felt with their heart. And the Holy Spirit moved them. A drought that was going to shake the whole empire. They would send this money by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. They would bring the gift back to help those in Jerusalem. An interesting thing to note, uh, I believe this might be the first time in history, in the history of the world, where, you know, like one race slash country gives financially, practically to a different race slash country unconditionally. Wide-scale, organized, charitable giving. I don't know of any instance in the world, up in world history until this event right here in Acts 11, and I could find nothing with exhaustive internet searches. So this is amazing, this is an amazing thing here, that these Gentiles, these non-Jews, up in what we call Turkey today, what was known as Syria back then, Antioch, the city, there's going to be a famine. So let's raise money and send it to Israel, to the Jews, to our Christian brothers and sisters that live in a different country, that have a different ethnicity, and we're going to do this unconditionally, not to make some kind of political or military alliance. We just want to give to them unconditionally because of the need, because of compassion. Think of where this goes. As we see even today, it started a whole new understanding and opening for Christian charity, Christian relief organizations, heartfelt stuff, agape love, our attempt at demonstrating the love God has for us, we can show to others. Compassion, compassionate giving. So when people say, oh, you Christians, hey, so you know, we, we're Christians, and did you know it was the Christians who started the whole concept of funding other people in other countries and other ethnicities for no reason other than just to be charitable or kind or generous? That's our heritage. What's yours, we might ask them. So we know that it's in our heritage to help others, our Christian heritage. Compassion is our culture. It's the Christian culture. You're going to see it in your Bibles. You're going to hear about it from this pulpit. And you're going to see it in the lives and the people in this church throughout Christendom. And you know what? 
you'll need compassion too. And you will give compassion. It's in our DNA. It's our heritage under the Lord. Remember compassion. Here we go. So remember compassion, please, every day. Like the example of the new Christians in Antioch. Compassion for fellow believers. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Do not call out the page number. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Let's read. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. I think I forgot to advance the slide. I did. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Ah, yes, the good Samaritan. This is a story we know well. A story about compassion. An illustration of compassion in red letters. Directly from the words Jesus. The victim here was traveling the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. This was in Judea. This road did not go through Samaria. So thinking through neighbors in a geographical sense, people that live with you, near you, you know, your neighbors, the victim here would have been more likely physical neighbors to the priest and the Levite. Yet they did not stop and render aid to their neighbor. You know about Samaritans, right? They were pretty much seen as inhuman, non-people, unclean, like pigs. Most Jews of the day would walk clear around Samaria. You see there? Jerusalem on the south and many, many things that, you know, Sea of Galilee and other things to the north. Samaria is in the middle of many major travel paths for the, for the Jewish people. And most of them would still walk all the way around, literally go days out of their way then set foot in Samaria or get Samaritan dust on their sandals. Why they wouldn't even ask a Samaritan for a glass of water if they were even dying of thirst. But the Samaritan, the least of these, he was the one that showed compassion for the helpless dying man. He had no skin in the game. He wasn't his neighbor. Oh, but he was. He treated him Neighborly, he treated any person in his vicinity in need as his neighbor. And that's exactly what Jesus was telling the lawyer here in Luke. Remember compassion, please, every day, even for those who do not believe. Here's a pondering point. Out of all those that Jesus could have chosen to be a good neighbor to this man lying near nearly dead on the side of the road, Jesus chose the most despised person possible. 
Oh, but Jesus goes much further than that. The Good Samaritan did more than just observe the fallen traveler as others had. In fact, he goes above and beyond the requirements of the law when it came to helping out a stranger in need. He performed nine acts of compassion for this wounded stranger. He went to him, he poured wine and oil on his wounds, he bound his wounds, he set him on his own beast, he brought him to an inn, he took care of him, paid the innkeeper two denarii, asked the innkeeper to take care of the stranger until he could come back, and then offered to pay any additional bills and charges when he returned. Unlike the priest, the Samaritan touched the traveler with hands of kindness and compassion. No ceremonial reason restrained him. He didn't even hesitate. He bandaged the stranger's wounds. He bathed his sores. He helped him to get to a safe place where he could recover. This was a beautiful picture of compassion. A Christian leader was once invited to speak at a large gathering of women in an affluent church. Before he spoke, the, women, the, uh, the woman leading the meeting relayed an urgent financial need from one of the church's missionaries. She asked if the speaker would lead the group in prayer for God uh, to supply the need. He came to the podium and shocked the group by saying he would not lead the group in the requested prayer, but that he would do something else. He would contribute all the money that he had in his pockets to meet the needs of the missionary if all the women in the group would do the same. If, when the money was collected and counted, funds were still lacking, he would be happy to lead the, in prayer for God to supply the rest. You can guess what happened. When the money was collected, there was more than enough to meet the missionary's needs. Prayer is good. Prayer is vital. And prayer is an important part of compassion. But we cannot use prayer as a means to avoid doing the work God has already laid out for us and equipped us to do. Be compassionate and pray for the Lord to direct you how and where to do it. We are his hands and his feet. When Jesus asked the lawyer at the end of the parable, which of the three men had demonstrated that he was a neighbor and to the wounded man, the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy. He couldn't even bring himself to say the Samaritan which brings us to the most shocking aspect of this parable. Are you ready for this? Not only was the Samaritan the good neighbor, the compassionate neighbor, are you sure you're ready for this? Not only was the Samaritan the good and compassionate neighbor, um, okay, this is going to blow your mind. Jesus not only uses the Samaritan as an emblem of compassion, but uses the most hated per people in his audiences to describe himself. To describe himself and his ministry. I want to compare verse 33 and verse 37. In verse 33, Jesus said that the Samaritan had compassion on the man who had fallen victim to robbers and was left for dead on the road. In verse 37, the lawyer says that the Samaritan showed mercy. So the Samaritan showed compassion and mercy. The Bible uses the words compassion and mercy a lot to describe whom? The Lord God himself. In other words, the Samaritan was demonstrating the attributes of God when he helped this poor man lying half dead on the side of the road. Who else constantly and consistently demonstrated the attributes of God? Hmm, I wonder, anyone pop into your mind? That's right, it's our Lord Jesus Christ. He never ceased to have compassion on his neighbors. The very reason for his coming into the world was that God had compassion on his people who were lying bruised, beaten, and almost dead in their sins. He sent the Lord Jesus into the world to save those who believe in him. As the Apostle John so brilliantly and beautifully declares in John 3, 16 and 17. Jesus was and is the ultimate good Samaritan. When Jesus looked around, he saw opportunities to help everyone, and he was moved to compassion over and over again. He demonstrated his compassion in so many ways to so many people, to the sick. Unlike the priest and the Levite, he wasn't afraid to physically touch them and heal them. 
He was compassionate towards the needy. He was compassionate towards widows and mothers. He touched lepers and he cleansed them. He touched dead bodies and brought them back to life. He befriended social pariahs and made them his disciples. He was compassionate towards everyone, Jews, Gentiles, and yes, Samaritans, even Samaritan women. The more difficult his life became, the more people crowded around him with demands. The closer he got to his torturous death on the cross, the more loving and compassionate and forgiving he became. His last acts were to pray for the forgiveness of his murderers to have John look after his widowed mother and feel compassion for a dying thief whom he encouraged and promised salvation. When Jesus saw a broken humanity, his heart was moved with compassion. And in the story, the Samaritan saw this broken traveler through the eyes of Jesus and had compassion on him. Divine, extravagant compassion for this broken, hurting man. Remember compassion, please, every day. Be a neighbor, a loving neighbor. Love them as yourself. Just as Jesus tells the lawyer, not just the people around your cul-de-sac, your neighbor is everyone around you, everyone in your proximity, everyone you can touch, everyone you can impact. Sometimes people not even near you. Maybe people in Antioch or Jerusalem or to the ends of the earth. How far can you reach in this day and age? Pretty far, I imagine. You have neighbors far, far beyond the lacy city limits. And I'm not talking about DuPont. Remember compassion, please, every day. We so desperately need compassion ourselves. The Lord has been so compassionate to me. The Lord fills us in abundance in his overflowing grace, mercy, and compassion. He wants us to use that filling and have compassion for others. It's how he manifests himself to others and other people's lives through me and through you. Let me say that again. The Lord has chosen to use our compassion for others, our caring for others, as the way he manifests himself to people here on this earth. He uses us. He uses our hands and feet. He uses our resources, our time, and sometimes even our money. For some, the only Jesus they will ever see during their time on earth is expressed in your care and compassion. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Father, this is a lot to take in, Father, but it is abundantly clear what you have us to do, Father, that you have so much compassion and you call us to be compassionate. You give us that charge, Father, and you equip us to do that. You send people to help us. And Father, you give us a wonderful example, Father. And Father, we just give over every need to you, Father. We ask you to Help us to see with your eyes and feel with your heart, Lord. We invite you into our days and our weeks ahead. Help us to be compassionate. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. It's amazing to think how a group of what we would call baby Christians would be so willing to have compassion on the seasoned Christians of their day. Um, but I, I, they understood that God's always there for us and we can be there for each other because of who he is. Um, the next song we're going to sing is It Is Well. And it's one of my favorites. And I think it ties into what Rob was talking about, somebody who had compassion and had a tender heart in the face of persecution. If you don't know the story behind the song, you really should go look it up. Um, the man who wrote it lost everything. And as he stood over the point where his, he lost his entire family, he wrote the lyrics to this, this song.
this reminder. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what you do, we can know that it is well. No matter the persecution or the trials that we see coming, we can know that we can do whatever it is you have for us. Have the compassion and the mercy and the tender hearts that you want us to have because everything that you have done is ordained before any of us were by you. And you know all of it. So we can all say, it is well with my soul. I pray that we would go out and remember that this week. And I pray for all of these people here that they would have a safe week, a productive week, but more importantly, that they would have you on their minds this week. I pray these things in your name. Amen.